Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for a nice introduction. And my name is Ken Koyanagi, editor at large uh, of the Nikkei Asian Review. Um, just to introduce myself a little bit, uh, I joined Nikkei in 88, and ever since then, I've been basically a journalist covering lots of things. In early 2000, I was uh, Silicon Valley Bureau correspondent and bureau chief covering all the technology companies, including uh, Apple, Google, and um, Cisco Systems, <laughs> Microsoft, all of, the, all of those things. And uh, three years ago, I was asked to, uh, uh, by, by our senior management, I was asked to develop a new English language news publication from Nikkei. And uh, I did, I planned and designed and uh, hired and uh, built team and built this public, new publication called Nikkei Asian Review, which is a news publication by the Asians of the Asia about Asia uh, in English language for the world. And uh, I'm delighted to be here to represent the publication. And probably you know that Nikkei Inc. Uh, in summer announced to acquire Financial Times of the UK, and I'm in the, uh, we are in the last minute process of uh, closing the deal. And I think we will be able to announce the uh, formal uh, closure of the deal and merger uh, on, in early December. So uh, I hope you will look forward to what's going to happen between the two organizations. Um, today, uh, I was asked to moderate this panel on uh, navigating the waves of change uh, challenges of globalization in Asia, and how some are successfully uh, navigating these waves. And I'm, I'm delighted to moderate this panel. And it turned out that uh, most of our panelists uh, have uh, a rich experience in dealing with Japanese corporations. And uh, so mainly we're going to talk about how Japanese companies are dealing with globalization and how well they're doing and how not well they're doing, and uh, how we can expect Japanese corporations to be uh, truly a globalized organization going forward. That's uh, key issues we're going to address. And uh, first, as a Japanese business reporter, I'd like to ask a very simple question, which is whether or not uh, present-day Japanese corporations, largely, mostly large corporations, are really globalizing. That's a that's a very simple, raw question I'd like to ask uh, of these experts we are having here. So first, uh, probably I would start with the other end of a panelist uh, from Yugi-san, who is currently really dealing with uh, Japanese people working for American technology company. So. Uh, I think uh, you are experiencing a lot of experiences uh, in how Japanese people and company workers are dealing with the globalization. So first uh, question is, are Japanese companies really globalizing or are Japanese corporate citizens really globalizing? Could you share some experiences, uh, Japanese corporate management's actions, decisions that reflect level of seriousness or reluctance for truly transforming? Probably you can talk about your customers as well. So first, Miyuki-san, please. Um, thank you very much. Is the microphone on? Um, so uh, essentially, in terms of um, Japanese companies, do they wish to globalize? Um, yes, of course they do. Um, we sank to being the number three economy um, instead of the number two economy recently. And with the shrinking population and the market size itself um, becoming smaller in Japan, it's, it's imperative that Japanese companies globalize and get their value proposition out there to find new markets. Um, in the past, um, particularly after the uh, Second World War, you had uh, tremendous aggression and energy being shown by Japanese companies like trading companies, Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Sumitomo, going out all over the world, um, you know, building things. And, um, and then you had the manufacturing companies, the people that made white goods, etc., really bursting on the scene and becoming household names in the U.S. and Europe. And what we're starting to see is that 
as um, we have become a more mature economy, and one of the most ma mature, sophisticated economies, we're kind of losing our way a bit um, in terms of, you know, how do we go to the next level? And I think the key is around really being innovative and, and bringing innovation to the world. Um, there are lots of innovations that Japanese um, companies and individuals are producing. At the moment, we have the highest number of um, patent registrations and so on, but we're not really kind of monetizing these in a way that really wows the world or disrupts the way we do things. So I think the next stage of growth for Japan has to come from really being bold, um, being risk-taking, and disrupting the markets. I come from an IT background. Um, and uh, whereas Japanese companies are well known for the quality and standards and innovation in things like manufacturing, robotics, I think I see in the world of IT that, you know, the big IT names are um, foreign ones. Um, you know, people like Fujitsu, NEC, Hitachi, they want to go abroad, they want to compete, but the, the, the behemoths are Apple, Microsoft, ourselves, um, HP and IBM. So um, we really need to kind of change the game. Um, you know, industries are being disrupted. The big disruptors are people like Uber, um, Spotify, and Airbnb. We need to kind of be, come out of our uh, area of complacency. And I think Japanese culture um, has to become more risk-taking. Be prepared to disrupt oneself and the order of things. And I think the way that um, societal shackles are still in place perhaps has, uh, is part of the reason why we're not prepared to be quite as bold and as disruptive going into um, the rest of the 21st century. Thank you, Buick san um, Just probably it's a related question, but I, I'm curious, um, how do you think your customers are thinking their IT infrastructure in a global terms? Uh, are they changing or are they just uh, implementing IT or networking infrastructure in uh, uh, individual locations or are they thinking globally? That's a very, very good question. I think, you know, um, someone made the comment earlier that the world is shrinking because of technology, but it doesn't feel as if it's shrinking as fast as it should. Um, I think, um, you know, our companies are looking at things like um, the Internet of Things. Uh, we call it the Internet of Everything at Cisco, whereby not just things and machines are connected to each other, but people and processes and data are connected to each other. And I think that's where the next big industrial revolution is going to come um, from, you know, this connectivity, this automation, um, which will not just um, help reduce costs and productivity, but give rise to new ways of serving customers and new market opportunities. Um, and, you know, that's a place that uh, we really want to play in. Japanese companies, um, there is a danger of Japanese IT systems and platforms uh, developing in an isolated and Galapagos-type manner. This has got to stop. You know, we need world global standardizations. This happened once before with our mobile systems and our SIM chips and so on. We can't um, be left behind in a little kind of isolated bucket. In other words, in other words many companies are still in that way of thinking. I mean, they are yet to change their way of thinking. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of vertical integration in IT in many companies. Um, they don't actually necessarily think beyond, you know, because you're not just dealing with your colleagues in your companies. Um, in order to uh, get the business outcomes you want, you need to be able to just go and grab um, the ideas, the supplies, the services that you need from outside your organization, outside of your country, um, and be able to turn them in a very agile, very fast way, fast-moving way, into business outcome that, that works for your business. I think Japanese companies tend to still be kind of, let, let's look within our organization, let's look within our consortium um, and, and try and get the solutions there. Um, and uh, you, you look at a lot of websites um, of Japanese companies and they say, we want to be the global leader, we want to be internationally recognized. And so they have these global aspiration statements and you look at their um, annual reports and you find that 80, 85% of their revenues still come from Japan. Okay. Thank you, Miyuki san And then uh, next, uh, Georges san uh, Monsieur Georges. <laughs> um, he's an expert on J Japanese competitiveness and uh, led the recent project of, uh, uh, what was that, Japan? Um, Productiv productivity. And uh, so, in your opinion, do you think uh, Japanese companies are 
uh, really globalizing, or they're still half globalizing or partially globalizing? Uh, I think the um, the issue is what you, you know. The term globalizing is a bit of a misnomer because you know Japanese companies are extremely international, so that's not the issue, and they are you know present in multiple countries, and not just the trading houses, but most of the large companies. The question is whether they operate using all the best uh, from uh, the global uh, environment and to be in, in being open. So when um, we did this um, uh, uh, macroeconomic research on Japan, we looked at um, a one particular uh, angle, which is uh, the productivity growth, because we uh, have uh, uh, realized that um, Japanese industries, by and large, are now lost competitiveness versus um, the other advanced economies. Um, we then looked into details into uh, four industry sectors from advanced manufacturing, retail, uh, financial services, uh, healthcare, to try to understand where were the gap and what was the difference. Uh, what was fascinating uh, was that um, it comes from three themes. One is about best in global best practices, and one one is um, the second one is around technology revolution, and the third one is around what I would call structure and governance. Uh, but the vast majority, two thirds of this, is is this notion of uh, uh, improving the and pre, uh, putting in place in companies in a systematic and disciplined manner uh, global best practices. Because if you look at most Japanese companies I work with they tend to be very good at two things, which is uh, the traditional manufacturing and development, where they apply the Kaizen approach, Monozukuri approach, in a very systematic, disciplined manner everywhere in the world. On those dimensions, they are totally global, right? Uh, but if you take any of the other functions, uh, sourcing, uh, supply chain, uh, marketing, pricing, uh, and even more, things like HR or finance, um, it is very, very, very mixed in terms of, you have, of course, pockets of excellence, that's not the question, uh, but it is not made with the same level of uh, um, discipline, nor is it, are they importing leading edge uh, notions, so they don't transform their IT, uh, they are uh, late on the, on, on the systems, they are late on the processes, they are late on the people development. And so, if you think about what they need to do, it is not about becoming more present in other places. It is about transforming internally, importing some of the best, retransforming the way they operate, and then retraining uh, the whole uh, labor force to actually get to that level. Uh, and so that's, that's the real challenge of globalization. Um, it's, not, um, it's not about, um, it's not about, um, uh, speaking English per se, it's not about uh, being present in more countries, it's not about uh, losing the Japanese roots. It is about um, innovating their own business processes to actually leverage their technology and leverage their strengths. Do you know any Japanese corporations uh, who or which are exceptionally advanced in that respect? Uh, different from other uh, general uh, average Japanese corporations? Um, I think you have, I mean, you know, it's, that's why I, I always hate to generalize to some extent because I think this is a, you know, this, <laughs> this is the third largest economy in the world, if you believe the Chinese numbers. This is a, a the, um, and so therefore in, in every of these uh, situations you have absolutely leading edge companies and you have uh, companies that are uh, that are uh, doing less well. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, and you know, you, whether you take to, uh, like a, a Toyota who is, you know, qu quite an impressive in their own way, uh, or, um, you know, you see uh, uh, some people that are very domestic. Um, I think we were commenting earlier, I think you have, a, it's amazing in some of the SMEs also who are incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, globalized and incredibly, uh, so the pockets of excellence, this is not nothing wrong, this is nothing systematic about being Japanese. It is about whether there is there's been this will to change. What I find personally very interesting is to see how many of these companies are actually starting to really go into that journey of transformation. Uh, so we work, um, you know, again, it's, uh, it's my own little myopic view of the world, right? But uh, uh, we work in, uh, in the number one and number two in most, sec most uh, sectors, uh, industry sectors we're working on exactly this topic. Half of our work is around transforming the way 
they operate their different uh, functions and becoming and do them on a global basis. So I get very encouraged that there is actually a, 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 a wave of transformation and that uh, many of these companies have, uh, have uh, adopted that mindset that they need to become a, you know, less, that they don't, it is not sufficient to be uh, competing to be the top spot in Japan, but they have to be a global champion. Okay. Um, next, uh, uh, George San. It's he's different. He's George, and uh, he is George. So <laughs> please, please distinguish these two <laughs> persons. But uh, George San, um, uh, who has lots of experience in uh, sitting at the board of Japanese corporations, and also uh, teaches at Keio University, and also I would like to share uh, your views and experiences about. Uh, Truliness or seriousness of Japanese corporations about globalization. Uh, I hope you you can cite uh, some concrete names. I mean, you know, uh, examples. Um, right. um, is that all? Yep. I, I mean, you know, as as George mentioned, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it depends on what you mean by globalization. Um, and uh, I've been on now five boards of Japanese companies, and without exception, um, all five companies um, either already have a significant presence overseas or are determined to, to build one. And during the time I've been a board member at those companies, you know, they have made significant acquisitions uh, overseas, and in every single case, they aim to grow their overseas business substantially over the next 10 years. Uh, I think there are important sectoral differences um, and the challenges in each of the sectors is, is um, are, are the, the challenges are very different. Um, in the manufacturing sector, this has already been pointed out, um, you know, I, I, would, I would say that Toyota, Georges said it, they're good in their own way. I mean, I think Toyota is good in almost every way um, and uh, I think uh, just the, the recent scandal at Volkswagen has highlighted, you know, the productivity, uh, the, the number of, you know, Toyota makes as many cars as Volkswagen, but with, you know, something like 40% less employees. Uh, and I, I work, I'm on the board of a, of a company called Denso, which is one of the world's leading uh, parts suppliers. And when I go around the factories overseas, um, I, I almost start crying because, it's, they're so excellent. Um, and you just think, how can Bosch, how can ZF, how can anyone beat this? And I, 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 I don't think, in terms of manufacturing excellence, um, I, I don't think they, they can be beaten. And, um, but you know, when I, I think the services sector is a completely different story. Um, and Muki has already mentioned the, the, the high tech and IT and software, which seems to be a, a very uh, problematic sector for, for Japan. But even if you compare, for example, um, in the consumer um, products area, um, it's always very depressing to see a company like Kirin. Um, when I was working in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in an investment bank, I listed the shares of Kirin on the London Stock Exchange in 1990. And in 1990, Kirin were number four. They had an enormous pile of cash, and they said they were determined to become a global beer brand. And here we are 25 years later, and they are number, 20, uh, num sorry, number 10 and we have companies had no, that no one had ever heard of in, or didn't even exist in, uh, in, in, in 1990, SAB and um, uh, AB InBev, who are absolutely number one. Um, who, you know, Kirin did not make the necessary um, investment in their organization. They didn't have the courage to go out and, and buy brands. But on the other hand, you have a company like JT, uh, Japan Tobacco, um, who, uh, which was a state-owned mon tobacco monopoly uh, which is now fighting with BAT for the number three spot. And they have gone about systematically acquiring uh, global brands. It's interesting that this company, the international side of JT, is managed out of Geneva. And if you look at the JT International Board that manages this company in, G in Geneva, it's 25 people, only two Japanese. And the people who manage this company are taken from the RJ Reynolds International Business, Gallagher, 
And JT has, you know, the largest share of tobacco uh, uh, in, in Russia, which is the, has the world's largest percentage of male smokers, something like 55% of all male Russian smoke. So this is a, a very important mar market to have uh, a, a big market share. So um, you do get these sort of hopeless cases, but you also get um, people who've systematically gone about things doing the right thing. So it, the answer is not, not, so, uh, is not so straightforward. Totally agree. I, I think you uh, made a very good comparison between Kirin and JT. Um, yes, they say we, we, we are determined to go global or you know, globally competitive. But look at Kirin. Um, I think they have been doing their best to be competitive internationally, but that they probably miscalculated the speed of others. So they were running their own speed at their own speed, but they, they haven't calculated the other speeds. So after 25 years, they found themselves running uh, one around or two, two rounds behind. And that's, uh, that's actually this, uh, my question, uh, how serious uh, average Japanese large corporations are about uh, globalization. And um, I doubt they are, they are so serious. And um, after uh, hearing these discussions, what do you think, Professor uh, Nariand? So I'm the token academic on this very distinguished panel. And um, I had a couple of questions going through my head. Um, the first one was around the question of, are they globalizing? It seemed to me the implicit question that was being asked was not, are they globalizing, but are they globalizing enough? Um, which begged the question, you know, uh, compared to what, right? So uh, that was the first question that went through my head. The second question that went through my head was, well, if we're talking about Japanese organizations, are we presuming then that there are other organizations, American, German, whatever you like to think about, who are doing a job much better than Japanese organizations? So these were the two questions that went through my head. And, and, and the question, the first question, if I go back to that first question, there has to be the only benchmark that we should care about. The only, I mean, I'm a strategy professor, right? So this is the benchmark that I care about, is competitive advantage, right? Is competitive advantage of a organization in a particular sector being eroded, right? That's the question. If it is, then the question is why? Now, about six years ago, a colleague of mine, Eve Doze, along with some other colleagues said, look, the date or, or the era of the global organization has passed. And essentially, the global organization is still an organization that even though it's present, as you correctly said, in multiple parts of the world, has many employees and things like that, still has a national character, right? It has a national character. It comes from a certain country, and the characteristics, the economic characteristics of that country lend it competitive advantage. Yves Doe said that era has passed. Increasingly, we're moving to the era of a meta-national. And a meta-national essentially thinks about distributing productive activities anywhere in the world to maximize competitive advantage. That's what globalization looks like today. And the question is, are Japanese corporations, or for that matter, any corporation, doing that enough? And my hypothesis to you is nobody's doing that enough. There are very few exceptions, but there are very few people who are doing that enough. And the reason for that... Um, I think a couple of comments here that were made about board members were really insightful because that's the challenge, really. Can organizations wrap their heads around the fact that their core identities need to change if they are indeed to behave as metanationals? Which means it's not just about boards, it's not just about managements, it's not just about where they are, it is their genuinely organizations that are present anywhere in the world for competitive advantage. From that perspective, Kensan, I have to tell you, I have not seen a lot of organizations that have made that particular transition. I'll comment Please. on that because I think um, it's an interesting uh, uh, debate I've had in, in Japan and in China for, for the same reason on uh, do you need to be a what you call a meta organization with no actual roots, or should you be a root? I have a different opinion, which is I actually think that uh, uh, mo a very many successful organizations tend to have very strong roots. So if you take, uh, uh, whether you take in banking, uh, BNP Paribas or Banco Santander, both, you know, very, uh, uh, you know, at 
BNP Paribas, most people in the top are French speakers. Right. Uh, in Santander, you know, it's pretty Spanish. Uh, so I don't think there is something wrong with having a root, and I think it will still last for a while because it is sometimes a unifying thing. I think the real question is, can you function with a uh, global uh, uh, with a global mindset, uh, regardless of what your route is. And that's, I think, where some of those companies have difficulties. Um, we were talking a bit earlier before we uh, were here about some of the uh, interesting examples. I mean, a lot of people get very worried about the Chinese companies going abroad, PetroChina, et cetera, Huawei, et cetera. Um, I actually think that's what's interesting is to look at examples of companies that are doing things very, very differently. Uh, to me, one of the major, most interesting example is Lenovo, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, uh, PC computer company, who actually is uh, becoming a complete transnational uh, with multiple cultures, but who still retains a Chinese origin in a sense, but functions very well with that. I think that's what we're seeing, at least in my view, with um, uh, Asegawa uh, is trying to do at Takeda, um, and, um, and I think we'll see whether that, those type of examples. That may be a way of the future, but I don't think it's a question of national origin as opposed to do you have a group of people within the corporations who are willing to embrace different topics and to your point, becoming much more open to innovation from outside and transform them into something that's efficient. Probably Professor Narayan was talking about uh, the way companies are run or managed, and if a particular company is run uh, in a way where people must understand what the originating culture is all about, uh, probably it will be difficult for that company to be really globalized and operate in a globalized way. But in, on, on, another hand, on the other hand, in terms of branding, I, I think a uh, certain brand needs certain culturality or nationality or geographical origin. Right, um, and I'm curious, what do you think about Uniqlo? Uh, to me, I, I think uh, Uniqlo is one of the most globalized or most uh, universally uh, operated companies um, among Japanese uh, corporations, and they are actually expanding both in advanced world and uh, uh, emerging markets uh, equally, and they're, they are growing very rapidly. And uh, uh, I suspect they have a kind of methodology of running company where uh, all those local employees can uh, easily understand how the company is run. What do you think, Professor? Um, so, so I know nothing about Uniqlo. I just wear their clothes. Um, and uh, I enjoy wearing their clothes. I buy them in New York. I buy them in Singapore. I buy them in Japan. I buy them everywhere. So they must be doing something right. But I want to come back to one point about this whole notion of identity. Can I be provocative here? Yeah? What is INSEAD? <laughs> is this a French institution? I put it to you, it still is, right, in some way, shape, or form. Even though we've been present in multiple parts of the world, there's a certain core of our identity, the way we think. Um, uh, there, there, and and it, takes, it takes a while to change, right? It doesn't change overnight. Why? Because you think of our board members, you think of our alumni, you think about some of the senior Japanese alumni who are present here in the room, they speak French. Right, they just did because they went to INSEAD and Fontainebleau. So the n nature, that, that characteristic, there's nothing wrong with that as Georges said, right? It gives you a sense of identity, it gives you a sense of belonging, it gives you a sense of commonness. All of that is great, but bring it back to one important question. At what point does that start impinging negatively on competitive advantage? That's the question. And, uh, you know, that's an empirical question. It's not a, a ideological one at all. And I think uh, time will tell as to whether those organizations who are able to take the step to become genuinely universal in character, whether they do start generating a competitive advantage. Sorry. And also, also I'm curious. Um, sorry. Oh, were you, were you about to? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Um, Yes, um, I'm curious what, what our panelists think about the uh, uh, difference between uh, East Coast IT companies and uh, Silicon Valley companies. Uh, because um, I've been really impressed by the book called uh, how, uh, how Google uh, Runs. Um, 
And uh, the way of employing people and hiring people, uh, evaluating and uh, goal setting uh, is very, very innovative and disrupt disruptive in a way, uh, but truly democratic and uh, looks very different from the old way of running big corporations, even in the United States. And uh, I'm wondering what made this possible in the West Coast? And uh, what is the um, mechanism of enabling this kind of uh, innovative way of running companies? Because those innovative ways of running companies seem to be really, really universal and meta-national in your words. What is the secret? Miyuki-san, probably. I think just following on from um, Professor Narayanan's point about you know national identity, but going beyond that to become globally relevant, I think the key is the openness to diversity. At the end of the day, INSEAD, as I see it, is a very, very diverse organization, and in fact, hence the dynamism that comes from it because of the fact that they are interested in the world and uh, you know different ways of, of running businesses, and they also have people from all over the world that share real experiences, etc. I think what Japanese corporations, if I can bring it back to Japanese corporations, I don't know a lot about East Coast or West Coast, you know, other than the fact I work for a West Coast company, um, is that um, it, it's very, very homogeneous. And, um, you know, it's, it's very Japanese. Uh, the language of business is Japanese, even when a lot of these Japanese companies go abroad. Um, you know, they internally communicate in Japanese. Um, not a lot of different nationalities working at every level of the organization. Um, and uh, not a lot of women. I have to say something about women. Um, you know, uh, the World Economic Forum um, recent rankings, I, I, I know we, we love or hate rankings, but um, rated Japan as sixth in global competitiveness, which is not bad at all, um, but then 83rd in terms of female empowerment, which is extremely sad. And it's only when you have this diversity that you have this energy and dynamism and willingness to kind of look at new ways of solving problems and coming up with um, new value propositions. Um, and that's where I think corporations um, are not perhaps moving as fast as they could be. It's, is this, it's on, sorry. Um, I think it's, um, uh, J Japanese companies um, don't only have a very strong uh, national identity. Um, there is also a, an extremely strong enclosed community uh, uh, nature to these to these companies. Um, I've been doing uh, for the last three years. I've been talking uh, about globalization to 60 uh, senior members of a large Japanese financial institution. And the first year, um, I asked uh, them. They're all men, and they're all Japanese. How many of them had uh, after university gone to another institution and then? joined this bank, not one person. The second year, the HR department rang me up and said, Dr. Olcott, very, very uh, important uh, development. We have one person this year uh, who uh, didn't join this institution. And I said, oh, that's great. Uh, is he uh, Japanese? Uh, no, no, he's Chinese, actually. <laughs> but anyway, so last year's freak was a, was a Chinese, and this year, we have a woman. So 60, 60, 60, 180 people, one person who is a Chinese has been outside of that company. And at the level of the, of the board, um, there are something like 40,000 directors of listed Japanese companies. Uh, in 2001, there were 232 non-Japanese me uh, board members of Japanese companies out of 40,000. Here we are 14 years later, and we now have 274. And, you know, this, this is, um, and I'm three of those, uh, uh, it's, this, this is, uh, um, this is uh, really uh, unacceptable. Um, I, I don't think it's um, a problem of, of um, Japanese not wanting foreigners on the board, but I do think language is an extremely important issue. And the idea of producing uh, board papers in English, of having translators or interpreters in English, is a really very big hurdle. But governance um, uh, is, is, is not just about having foreigners, it's about having a process of succession 
where the automatic choice is not just left to the president who nominates his successor, and only the president nominates his successor. And the president then moves up to the chairman. And then the chairman becomes honorary advisor, chief honorary advisor, senior chairman, honorary chairman, or something like that. Uh, and the old boys still dominate um, uh, the, the upper echelons. They have uh, uh, drivers and everything. Um, and it's very difficult for a new CEO to come in who, was, uh, who owes his loyalty to the president who appointed him to change the direction of the firm in a big way. So succession is also something that's very, very important to break this uh, strong mold of homogeneity which uh, exists in Japanese companies, um, in my view. Um, have you ever talked with Mr. Howard Stringer, who used to be CEO of Sony? Uh, only about rugby. <laughs> but I, did, I have spoken to him. But <laughs> um, he was probably the biggest example of having uh, non-Japanese uh, sitting on uh, CEO, title, CEO, CEO position in a big corporation in Japan. And well, um, yes, and, and you know what, what's depressing is, I mean, I was a director of a company called Nippon Sheet Glass, which bought a, a British uh, glass company twice their size. And because Nippon Sheet Glass was a very domestic company, didn't have any global uh, um, uh, expertise or global managers, imported the Pilkington managers to run the new NSG. Um, unfortunately, we, with the, the English CEO left after a year and a half. We then hired a, from an external source an American who lasted only a year. Uh, and when you see um, uh, what Takeda's trying to do and the opposition that um, uh, he's facing to try and globalize uh, that company, I don't know whether you saw the article in The Economist last week about SoftBank, yes. the extreme difficulties that Son is, is, trying, is ha experiencing internally from um, uh, um, getting this new guy from Google um, uh, in, in, engaged in, in, in the company. Uh, and this whole episode with Toyota and the lady who, um, who was allegedly importing illegal substances uh, and the way that was portrayed in the, in the, in the press was all about, well, what, that's what happens when you appoint foreigners. That's, what, you know, that's why it's so difficult to globalize. George, uh, would you agree what uh, George has said? <laughs> Of course. <laughs> uh, no, but I think it's a, it is a very difficult um, uh, process. And it is true that it is a very inward. Uh, you know, to some extent, you have to come back to history. And I think what's going to be uh, interesting is to see whether that will not happen in other parts of the world, by the way. But uh, if you look back at history, you know, in the 19, as far as I can tell when I talk, you know, the advantage of having honorary chairmen and chairmen and so on is that actually you can actually meet them and they have a, they can tell you about the history of the company with personal views. And it's striking to me that when you talk to a, a chairman who is in his 70s uh, in Japan, Japanese, first of all, they tend to speak very good English. They tend to be quite open. And they would tell you they, that they made their success, their career was around going and opening up countries with little suitcases and getting things done in a, and confronting the world. The last 20 years has been the opposite the, with the seniority-based system and, uh, and the fact that the, 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 there was actually more opportunities perceived in Japan. People actually stayed home. And therefore, because they stayed home, you have, and because there was a, this, this, this focus on cost reduction, um, they actually became, the companies became very inward looking and therefore that's what you have to break. So I think, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for the fact that it's very hard to break because this is, uh, you know, long uh, secular trends that have happened. Uh, I do believe there is enough people now that are starting to say, look, that is not the model of the future. And they are say, sh showing that they are lo losing the competitiveness. Um, and I think the younger generation are starting to say, we have to go uh, international again. So I'm, you know, I would say cautiously optimistic about this. Um, the interesting thing, and we we're talking here before, is that, uh, you know, it, it, there is a unique uh, uh, effect in Japan, uh, which was the fact that uh, there, there is a, there was this uh, curse of having the, s the second largest economy in the world, in a sense, because that was actually incentivizing people to stay local. I think you might see the same issue in China in the future, because when you have such a large market, the Chinese companies are, by and large, contrary to what most people, they are exporting abroad, but they're not necessarily very global. Um, India was very different. 
because India had this benefit of the Indian diaspora. Uh, correct me if I'm misinterpreted, but if I look at uh, my colleagues or others in, in India, many of them are completely you know, moving back and forth from the US. The companies uh, bet their future from uh, becoming international from day one, and therefore they don't have that problem at, at all. So I think if you come back to the spirit of globalization and how you get there, you have to, I think, I think, take into perspective a little bit about the history, and then this is where the change management efforts uh, becomes absolutely essential within each of the companies. Now you mentioned uh, seniority system, and, and that uh, leads to the question of uh, competitiveness of lifetime employment system, which is Japan is famous for. And uh, probably the fact that all those board members are all proper, uh, double quotation, proper uh, uh, salaried workers, uh, staying in the company for uh, 30, 40 years and then you know, reaching the top. Uh, <coughs> it's probably because of this lifetime employment system, it's so strong, and also seniority system is so strong. And uh, probably it is becoming a, a kind of hurdle for many Japanese companies to become really global organizations because if there are those uh, uh, rigid uh, regime, it is difficult to employ and uh, motivate non-Japanese workers in that organization. And probably it is time to change for uh, Japanese corporations to get rid of that uh, customs. And do you think there are any uh, indications that Japanese corporations are trying to change that lifetime employment seniority system? Uh, probably I would ask George probably. Yes. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think there are, um, there are attempts to change, um, but it's very slow um, and if you look, uh, as I did a few years ago, at a Japanese company's website, I was asked by Denso to go and talk to them about globalization a few years ago. And I looked at their website. They have an English global website and a Japanese global website. And I compared them with Bosch. Now, I, I've no doubt that Bosch is, a, in fact, a very German company. But Bosch is the, is the main competitor to Denso. And Bosch has a German site and an English site. And the, thing, the, the, the things that were very different about Bosch and Denso were, first of all, that the English and the German sites were exactly the same. Uh, in the Japanese case, the English site was completely different from the Japanese site, uh, and, and also very unattractive in both cases. But um, the other difference, that, which is even more important, was the fact that on the Japanese site, there was a, uh, there was a link to recruitment, uh, Sayo Joho. And in the Japanese, sorry, the English site, there was absolutely nothing about recruitment at all. <laughs> Whereas Bosch had a very, very sophisticated uh, German language and English language, both sites were exactly the same, talking about recruitment. And just the photographs they were using portrayed a very diverse, you know, there was a sort of a Brazilian type and a, a someone from the Middle East and Africa and, and, and Asia. Um, and so a recruitment for a Japanese firm means recruiting Japanese. And even at the boards, some boards, we have a, an annual report on university graduates. And uh, it's about how many Japanese graduates they have managed to recruit. And if I say, well, look, you have more employees now outside of Japan than inside. Why do you just talk about Japanese they, the recruitment? They say, well, I, that's a very good point. From next year, we'll talk about global recruitment. But it's, it doesn't really occur to them um, until they don't mind having it pointed out. And when you point it out, they, they, they do... Um, they do react and, and recognize the need for change. But when you have a very homogeneous, inward-looking organization with very few outsiders to point out these things, it's, 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 the pace of change is quite slow. I'm curious, for example, Denso, uh, when they hire and uh, employ uh, local workers in various parts of the world, how are they applying their internal HR system or HR rules or pay system or promotion system are they fragmented uh, by regions or...? Uh no, uh, there is no uh, global HR system in most Japanese companies. There's a system for Japanese employees and graduates, and there's a system for everybody else. 
Um, and well, I mean, it's not, it's just the way it is. Um, and I think there is a recognition that they need to produce a global HR database. And I'm sure that this is also the case at Korean companies and Chinese companies, by the way. Um, and, um, uh, but there is a recognition that we, that the Japanese companies really need to change this and have a, a, a globally, and, and, and Nippon Sheet Glass, when it acquired Pilkington, the, H, the global head of HR became, was a Brazilian. And he immediately instituted a global HR database and we have promotions, salary scales, which are common to, to all areas of the world. Did they, did they import Wilkinson's HR? Absolutely, global? 100%, okay. yes. Oh, okay, oh, that's good. How, how does it work at Cisco system? Does it have a global HR rules and... Uh, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the um, American companies have been successful at globalizing simply because they do. And we're an IT company, so we have an advantage, you know, all our systems. It's, it's very transparent, you know, what jobs are available in which country. Anyone can apply for any of them. And, um, you know, in terms of the, 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 the treatment of individuals, it's all the same. I think, um, I, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, workplace um, norms and practices. Japanese companies have a very rigid code of uh, working, work style. And, um, you know, whereas, say, European and American companies, you can work from home, you can work from anywhere, um, you know, you can have uh, the VP of something in Seattle and the VP of something else in New York. It doesn't really matter because the work kind of fits around your work style or, or lifestyle. And, you know, at Cisco, that's what we try and do. Um, is, uh, be again, because we're an IT company, we just allow people to work from anywhere and interact. So if you've got a meeting, it doesn't really matter wh whether you're joining from your home or from the airport or from Starbucks, you join. And because the, the, the quality of the tools are very good, it feels as if you're actually in the same room. Um, but, you know, Japanese companies, and I, I won't name names because most of them are our customers, um, have a real problem um, doing flex work or worky teleworking um, because they always come back to but face-to-face -face meetings and human relationships are important. Well, of course they're important, but so is the ability to be flexible and agile. And I think the trade-off is not quite there. Um, again, coming back to women, one area I, I have a lot of pride in is that we never lose our talented female, we, we actually haven't ever lost a female employee due to maternity leave. They always come back because during the first year or two of childcare, we just say, that's fine, you just work from home and join in meetings through, um, you know, uh, our tools, our telepresence systems. And even if they're customer facing, they can do that because then we just kind of lug the systems across to the customer. I'm curious, um, does anyone on this panel know uh, any Japanese companies who have been, who, has, who have transformed themselves from that uh, traditional Japanese type of hiring, employing uh, seniority system into very flat, uh, contract-based, uh, 360 degree uh, evaluation kind of um, modern uh, HR and employment system. Anyone know uh, Japanese listed large corporations who have transformed their a HR structure I, entirely? Ju just, just to, uh, I think it is, it is starting to, they're starting to try it. And there is always these balloons in the, in the press saying, uh, uh, you know, we will introduce uh, uh, performance-based uh, pays. And it's interesting because um, I remember there was um, another series of blurb last year. I went back, it was the same company for 15 years, and every year you had a, we will introduce it. So I, I, I think it will happen at one point, uh, but uh, it takes a while. Um, the real, one of the real, but I think we should also recognize that there is a, a challenge because you have to have a HR functions that actually uh, is capable of doing it, which I think is a very, uh, uh, is a very big challenge. By the way, I think you would have exactly the same problem in in Korea, uh, which I've worked extensively with some of the Che balls, uh, where the same thing, they have a, a it's a, a, a HR in, in many of the, um, these economies, uh, whether it's China, uh, um, Korea, or, or, or Japan, is much more of a assignment process uh, and then payroll and administration. It's not so much of a talent development and talent spotting and development. So 
you know, I think that's the, the, the that's what the challenge they're facing. Many of the many of the companies have the systems. They have the ranking system. They have the, uh, but they I don't have necessarily the professionals that can help them, which you have in 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 American companies or European companies that can help a person develop individually and they can understand it. So I think that's one of the challenges. I, f I believe I I I believe that uh, you know having strong HR capabilities. Uh, in the future will be uh, probably a skill that will be in very high demand in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Japan and Korea for sure. And George, do you have something? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's um, uh, Japanese companies will probably not change very dramatically in my, in my lifetime. Um, <laughs> and uh, actually, uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think there are important sectoral uh, issues here, and I think for many companies in the manufacturing sector in particular, the Japanese working environment is, I think, a source of competitive advantage. And I think for companies like Denso um, uh, and Toyota to throw away, um, I, even if they wanted to, they couldn't, but they shouldn't uh, change the many aspects of the stable uh, workplace that they have, uh, have managed to create. I think, particularly in the services industry and finance, I think Japanese companies need to pay attention to be competitive with their global uh, peers. They need to be able to hire the best people, and they're not going to do that uh, with their current salary structures and so on. So there are important sectoral differences, uh, which I think we need to, to bear in mind. Um, uh, uh, and I, I think it's, 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 it's very dangerous to say, well, Japanese companies need to, 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 to throw away uh, what they what they've built up over the years, and that because there is a danger of throwing the baby out with the the bathwater. Um, so I think that's something that needs to be needs to be said. Professor, if I may. So I think this is an extremely important point, and I just wanted to say one thing here. Um, everyone in this room has at some point had to deal with change. Yes. When does change happen? When somebody points a gun to your head? It doesn't happen voluntarily. Come on. Right? Which one of us put our hands up and say, oh yes, let's go along and change? No, we don't. So I think the big question to ask is, at what point is the pressure for change going to be sufficient that you're going to have to do it? I think if you haven't yet, uh, you know, nobody likes to wake up in the morning and, let me, and say, let me go to an environment which feels terrible, it's a lousy place to work, you know, I'm feeling depressed and yet I want to go. Nobody does that, right? So at some point you push and say you want to change. I think the question we have to ask is, why is it, if indeed this is true, because I don't, I don't know as much as you folks do, if it ind indeed it is true that organizations primarily based in Japan don't feel the pressure to make some of these changes that could potentially lead to competitive advantage, what is it about the environment or the competitive nature of the environment that they face that protects them from the need to do so for as long as it has? Um, and to your point, George, it may well be that we're approaching a time where that protection is going to go away in which case that change will happen. But I, I come back to the basic issue. It only happens when somebody points a gun at your head. And if it isn't happening, it means that gun is incredible enough. Yes, I, uh, I, I talk with some of the top management of Japanese corporations, and they, they are aware of this problem. And they say they, they want to change, and they need to change. But they tend to take a lot of time before doing anything, and the change a turn, turns out to be very, very slow. And it, true, it may not happen during my lifetime either. <laughs> but I, I think uh, you are right, uh, at, especially in the manufacturing uh, site, manufacturing lines, it's very important to, to have a legend of soldiers uh, who are really well organized and uh, you know, uh, flow information very smoothly. It's very important and it's helpful to have a kind of seniority uh, pyramid system, hierarchical system, but at the same time, uh, in the managerial field, I don't think, I don't see any merit of having seniority hierarchical structure. You, we need best talents from around the world, and to hire them, we need a universally acceptable uh, hiring scheme, and uh, that's something most of the Japanese com corporations are lacking. That's uh, what I think. <laughs> I think time is ticking. Uh, what do you think? I mean, do you think we have enough time? Uh. <laughs> I wish I could answer that question. <laughs> okay. Um, I think uh, 
there are some questions uh, among the audience uh, to anyone on the panel. So, okay, uh, one, two. Okay, so I start from that uh, gentleman over there. Uh, yes, in, in the fourth, lo fourth row. No, 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 over, over here. Um, you know, why even bother to change? Can I just point out something provocative? How many of the Fortune top 100 companies that were there 50 years ago are still there? And the answer is they're not, okay? Because what actually happens, and let look at Professor Koyama's uh, fantastic presentation, there are young entrepreneurs sitting in this room today who are going to create new companies in the spaces the professor was talking to that are going to take over the future anyway. So in a way, I would say there's Japan and it's fabulous and look at the beautiful picture there. And don't worry, the entrepreneurs and the people there are there and they're sitting in this room and uh, the afternoon is gonna be great. So it's a statement more than a question, but uh, that's how I see it as the outsider. So it's a statement rather than a question, but I, I see, so, comp <laughs> so competition is a key. Right, so competition, competitive pressure will force all those companies to change, otherwise they will die. That's, that's, that's your point, right? No, I just think it's an inevitable process. Uh, the, the, the young people, the ideas, and I have met already some entrepreneurs here, Japanese young people, bringing back ideas from the West Coast back here into, uh, into Japan, and the business models they're proposing, in my, what I heard so far, is world-beating, it's world-class. Um, so it's not things are gonna change, but things are going to evolve. If I could just make a comment, I, I, I do take a slight issue with the, professor, the, the professor's comment about you don't change until there's a gun to your head because you don't know where the gun's going to come from. And um, like with Uber or like with Airbnb, you just didn't know that these people were going to come and attack your hotel business or your car reservation system. And so I think you just need to be in a mindset to change because you don't know who your next competitor is going to be. Actually, uh, I, I agree with that because I, I think the, the point about competitors is, um, is an interesting one. You know, I, I, I was um, a couple of weeks ago with uh, Peter Ma, who is the chairman of uh, uh, Pinyan Insurance. Pinyan Insurance, he was telling the story. You know, he was started Pinyan 28 years ago with 13 employees in Guangzhou. Uh, they have now uh, 230,000 employees, 220 billion cap market cap, 850,000 agents. Uh, you know, you can name it in any dimensions. And so I was asking him, I said, you know, what, what do you think is the most important part of the culture that you think makes, makes you being, um, uh, make, makes the company being successful? And he said, um, it's having a sense of urgency every day, every minute. You know, every single day we have to ask ourselves, are we doing enough? Are we moving fast enough? Uh, will we win? Uh, and if we don't, then, we'll, then we will lose. And I think that's, that, I think, is, a, is, is one element that I think is, is actually happening by definition, I think, in many of the emerging markets because of speed. Uh, I think it's something that has sometimes been missing in advanced economies, um, uh, but it's something that has to be regained. Okay. Maybe there's one more. Oh, uh, the gentleman over there, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Takujo Kubo. I'm, uh, I run an uh, economic consulting company. My question is actually to you. I'd like you to talk about your company, Nikkei. Uh, in my view, Nikkei is actually a very Japanese company. Uh, for a media company, it's a fairly seniority based. And, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you, you, so, so, um, and actually, uh, but I look at you. Uh, so when I saw you as a moderator, I was actually expecting more typical Nikkei moderating, you know, just, <laughs> just. You know, very, but you then, seem to be very uh, knowledgeable <laughs> but, about Nikkei. But then I was actually very positively surprised to see how you moderate. Um, um, so I think you are, I would actually, I think for Nikkei, you are kind of an outsider. I mean, you, you, have a, you're a Japanese, <laughs> you have a Japanese face. But I think uh, in, your, in your company, I actually feel, you feel that you are often treated as a little bit of outsider. But you're still staying in Nikkei, and I do see some changes in the Nikkei. I mean, acquired FD, I think it's a great move. So, but how do you see, as an insider, uh, how do you see the challenge uh, working as you are in a, in a Nikkei, a Jap the Japanese company? 
Actually, the timekeeper is saying time is up, so I can, <laughs> I can run away, but uh, I take a little bit of time to explain. <laughs> thank you very much. So All right. Thank you. Um, so yes, I, I've been doing this uh, Nikkei Asian Review uh, uh, business development for the past couple of years, and I, I, I've been trying to hire a lot of uh, non-Japanese persons, journalists, actually, uh, around the world, well, around Asia. And uh, it's been very hard, really hard, because we have no rule or no experience in hiring non-Japanese outside Japan. So I have to design a contract each time I hire some person in a certain country. According to that country's uh, employment law, and um, employment-related law, and uh, I was just doing that, that HR kind of jobs myself, all by myself, in various countries. So it was really hard. So it, and now we are actually acquiring Financial Times, you know, there are thousands of people <laughs> at the time, and we, we don't have any system. So it's, I think I predict something similar to uh, uh, Wilkinson, bought by uh, Nipponshi uh, uh, Glass. Uh, will happen in Nikkei. I think we will import some of their HR uh, 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 customs and systems uh, to apply to entire Nikkei group. That's what I expect and predict. And um, yes, I've been staying with Nikkei for nearly 30 years now. And um, the reason why is um, actually I, I've been enjoying doing reporter job, I mean journalist job. And um, just that's just the uh, uh, only reason, and um, I didn't have I didn't have time to actually do uh, uh, job searching, <laughs> job hunting activities. I've been too too busy. That's that's probably the only reason. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, there are thank a lot of others, much. but thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the panelists. <laughs>